Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to Utility Sports. And in today's video, we're coming at you with the NFL Week 17 predictions and pick them. Of course, this has been a series we've been doing throughout this NFL season. It's been absolutely crazy. Another really great week of games in which I tried to make some progress and you'll get to see kind of how everything panned out what our pick em predictions and record are at this moment in time. So if this is something you do enjoy, make sure to leave a like, subscribe as well. We're gonna be doing more of this for the NFL playoffs, which are coming up soon as we are in the second to last week of the NFL season. A quick disclaimer, this gets recorded before the Washington football team and Dallas Cowboys Sunday night game. We record before the Sunday night primetime game every single week. So it can come out for you guys on Monday morning for everyone doing their pick em and predictions for the next week. So that's just a disclaimer. The records for uh, four teams, two games are not quite finalized yet at this point, but they'll be in there for next week. Our pick em records at this point, I'm 106 and 74 in Austin. You're 113 and 67. You continuously hold that seven game advantage on me. Guys, I thought this week I had a four game comeback opportunity. I picked uh, Detroit over Atlanta. They almost won that game. And I picked the New York Jets over, or the Jacksonville Jaguars over the New York Jets, excuse me. And they came within one yard of getting that done as well. Unfortunately, though, my teams did not come up for me. I still find myself seven games back, Austin. How does it feel to have such a good cushion going into week 17? Well, it shows that I can't just pull away from you, unfortunately. Uh, you just keep sticking around. Uh, I haven't gained progress for like three weeks. So uh, that's that's my bad. I, I'm, I'm playing. I just, I'm, I'm not right there yet. I, I need to be better. I only got two weeks left to hold the lead. But hey, this week is almost a four four game swing, potentially. Don't listen to Austin too much here. He would be disappointed had he predicted every single game right, which I'm honestly at this point surprised he hasn't. Moving into our very next part of the video, we got our locks this week, Austin, and we both picked against our own favorite teams. I'm opting for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as a lock over my New York Jets, and you're going with the New England Patriots as a lock over your Jacksonville Jaguars. I think this kind of goes to show how bad our two NFL franchises are. Jets, Jags, they faced each other this week. Uh, and they tried to lose. Uh, both teams were actually trying to win, of course, but based on the talent we have on the field, it doesn't appear that way. Austin, why are the Patriots a lock over Jacksonville? Oh, they're going to smoke them, and it's going to be brutal. Uh, Trevor Lawrence is going to be so confused the whole game. I, I predict three interceptions for him. Um, they maybe consider going to C.J. Beathard at some point in the game. It's going to be an ugly one. It most definitely will end up that way. Bill Belichick, after a loss, probably going to look at Jacksonville as an opportunity to get back on track. And for me, the Buccaneers, they found themselves back on track this week with a comfortable win after getting shut out to New Orleans a couple weeks ago. And I think they're going to continue, continue to use the New York Jets as a stepping stool into the NFL playoffs. Of course, they clinched their playoff, uh, playoff berth with a division win this week. And I think Tom Brady, with his experience against the New York Jets, He's going to take it to them all week long. Upsets here, though. We are going with a couple interesting games, Austin. You opted for the Cardinals going into Dallas as your upset. Of course, they've lost a few games in a row now, but you're not hitting the panic button on those Cardinals. What's your reasoning? Yeah, I actually do have the, the Dallas Cowboys over the Cardinals in that one. That is the upset. Uh, but for me, I think for Dallas, you have to consider it. Um, that, that's more of a must win. They want to keep going and, and try to get higher seeding. Uh, in the NFC. So looking at it there, uh, D Dak Prescott's going to need to have a huge game. We'll see how he does against Washington. But however, I, I think that this, this is a must win for them. And it's really a power struggle in that NFC. I opted for the Minnesota Vikings as the upset here over the Green Bay Packers. Packers come in at 12 and three. And the Packers are going to be, uh, you know, looking to clinch that number one seed in the NFC. But the Vikings, they're fighting for their playoff hopes at this point. They have to win out to really put themselves in a position to win and get into a wild card spot. Vikings need this game. It's in Lambeau. It's going to be a tough one. Mike Zimmer, however, historically for the Vikings has played the Packers to a 500 level. Of course, they've already beat them this year and they have to do it again. I'm going to put my money on the Vikings. I think they're going to bounce back after a loss to the LA Rams and they're going to have to play their best brand of football to get it done. Moving into our Sunday slate of games here now, Austin, we've got the Giants at Bears. Giants come in at 4-11 and after getting absolutely demolished by the Philadelphia Eagles. And the Bears at 5-10 and pull off a surprise upset win over the Seattle Seahawks. We both opted for the Bears here. What's one key storyline to watch for you? Yeah, so for me, it's going to be the Bears quarterback situation. Are they going to stick with Nick Foles? Are they going to go to Justin Fields? We're not exactly sure where that quarterback room lies. Uh, Matt Nagy, I, I thought it was very possible after this game 
uh, against Seattle that he was going to get fired. Maybe they don't fire him after a win. I'm not sure what their feelings are. For sure, by the end of the season, he will be. Uh, I don't know if this is the time and place for it. So, you know, the Matt Nagy headline is definitely one to be watching. And also, will Nick Foles be the starter? Yeah, you're right. You have that question. And of course, for the New York Giants, you're looking at a team that's just demolished right now. Daniel Jones out for the season. So the Bears, I think they're going to be the favorites coming in. And I think they get the job done at home at Soldier Field. Moving into our next one, Jaguars at Patriots. Austin, I've been notorious for picking the Jacksonville Jaguars this season. And at 2-13, and 13, maybe that's why I find myself seven games back in our pick them and predictions because uh, they've let me down time and time again. They were one yard away from maybe pulling it out against the New York Jets and just could not get it done. Unfortunately, of course, an illegal shift to end that game. It's unfortunate. Your Jaguars, they've struggled. Patriots 9-6 and six coming off a loss to the AFC East rival Buffalo Bills. Patriots are going to look to cruise in this one. They're at home at Foxborough. This becomes a nearly impossible matchup for Jacksonville. Is there any chance they get it done? You know, we thought that about uh, about Jacksonville versus the Bills, and they pulled off the 9-6 upset. So, I mean, this season hasn't made any sense. So, I mean, that's potentially could happen. However, it's Jacksonville. I don't see it happening again. And like I said earlier at the top of the show, I think it's going to be a brutal game for Jacksonville. Right, heading into week 17, had you told us that the Jacksonville Jaguars only have two wins at this point, we probably would have predicted both of them and came against the Houston Texans. In fact, neither of them did, but they did beat the Buffalo Bills. It's, just, it's a wonderful uh, and crazy season. That's the fun part about the NFL. It's hard to predict sometimes what you're going to get in week in, week out. You know, and these teams are competitive. I think the Jaguars are going to fight in this one, but the Patriots, just a better team. They're going to look to get back on track. They need this game badly uh, for that division. So I think they move to 10-6, and six, roll through the Jaguars here, and the Jaguars start to turn their attention toward the NFL draft sooner than later. Buccaneers at Jets, Austin. We talked about this a little bit more in the open as well. Got my thoughts on it. The Jets, just not really a team that you're going to be, see be able to compete with the Buccaneers. And I think the big thing is the Buccaneers are really going to take advantage of the Jets in the secondary. When Tom Brady has time, we saw Trevor Lawrence with a lot of time today, able to sit in the pocket and he was delivering good strikes. And I think it's going to be amplified there. When you see Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers come to New York, I think the Jets are going to struggle consistently getting after Tom. He gets rid of the ball too quickly. He reads the defense so well. And then I think Mike Evans uh, is going to have a good day. Antonio Brown as well. He's going to have a great game. Uh, he had a very good game today for the Buccaneers. What's your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think Antonio Brown's going to have a huge day. Other guys like Tyler Johnson are going to step up in a big way as well. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers are going to keep Tom Brady upright. Uh, you know, the Jets struggled to generate true pass rush all game long against Jacksonville. And I, I don't think that really changes against Tampa, who has an even better offensive line. So for the New York Jets, they got to hope they can get Quinnen back for this game because that's their only prayer at really generating true pass rush. Right, they need a little bit of help in the interior. Quinnen Williams, when he's healthy, does bring that a little bit. However, missed the game against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Falcons at Bills here, Austin. The Falcons, 7-8. and eight. I think that's another surprise we would not have expected before the season started heading into Week 17. And then the Bills at 9-6, and six, maybe a little disappointing. I think they're better than that 9-6 and six record would indicate because they've dropped some meaningful games that they usually would win. Of course, coming off a big win against the New England Patriots, however... And Austin, we're both going with the Bills in this one. More talent. Josh Allen, is he the difference maker in this game? Yeah, he, he definitely is. And I think Atlanta's secondary is going to have a really, really tough time against Stephon Diggs, Cole Beasley. It doesn't really matter. I think Josh Allen's going to take advantage of the secondary. He's going to make plays happen with his legs. Um, the Bills did a great job against the Patriots. Not, I believe they didn't even allow a sack in that game, uh, which New England is notorious at, at getting pressure and, and getting after the quarterback. So looking at the Buffalo Bills, it should be a good game. They're getting to play at home as well against this Falcons team who they've had a couple of lucky wins, um, but they've definitely been expected better than expected so far this season. Right. They definitely have played at a higher level. They're still not out of that playoff race for the wild card in the NFC. However, you'd have to think with the matchup against the Bills this week, it's not likely that Atlanta does get into the playoffs. However, they've had a nice season. Cordero Patterson has really emerged in Arthur Smith's first year there as a head coach, and they deserve a lot of credit for the way that they performed and played week in, week out. They fought hard in pretty much every single game, uh, and they do deserve a lot of credit there. Also, if you guys are interested in some playoff videos, we're going to be coming out with some playoff predictions and everything that we think with the playoff seating, what's going to happen down the last couple of weeks of the season. So stay tuned for that on the channel as well. This is a good time to remind you guys to be subscribed. Turn on that notification bell if you are interested in a video like that. 
Next one here is Chiefs at Bengals. The Chiefs are just rolling. They are such a monster unit on offense. Walked all over Pittsburgh in their matchup in Week 16. And they come in at week, uh, 11 and 4, going up against a very hot Bengals team in which Joe Burrow threw for over 520 yards. Uh, had a ton of touchdowns as well. I believe he threw four of them. C.T. Higgins had a huge day. Jamar Chase as well. They had a monster performance, Austin. However, we're both going on with the Chiefs here because of how much of a role they've been on as of late. How do the Bengals look to slow them down? Yeah, for the Cincinnati Bengals, you have to get after Patrick Mahomes. But at the same time, it's tough. When you generate interior pressure, uh, it's easy for Patrick Mahomes to roll out and really find that throwing lane on the run because he's just so consistently great at that. But for the Bengals, it's going to be about running the football. I think that's been a big key for them. When Joe Mixon is running the, the ball efficiently, it opens it up for play action. And obviously, we've seen what the Bengals have been able to do against a very tough opponent in the Ravens. Uh, Kansas City, they are absolutely rolling. They're on the road in this one, but they've just been so hot. It, it's hard to really foresee them even losing on the road to a very, uh, very competitive Bengals team. Right. I think that Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs have probably cemented themselves still as that top team in the AFC, even despite some of those early struggles in the season. Remember, at one point they were three and four and a lot of people were kind of questioning what this Chiefs team is. They've gotten their stride. And I think a key thing here is Steve Spagnuolo and that defense. They're going to have to send some pressure after Joe Burrow. You can't afford him a lot of time in the pocket because these wide receivers are just too good when they're given a lot of time to route run. And when Joe Burrow is protected, able to deliver strikes to his top tier wide receivers. Dolphins at Titans here, Austin. We have a little bit of difference in opinion here. The Dolphins 7-7 seven and seven before Monday Night Football. And the Titans 10-5. and five. They come off uh, an interesting performance where they... Uh, Cruise to a win. A.J. Brown put up a big time game in that one. And there are 10 and 5 here going up against Miami, who's been one of the hottest teams in football, not named Kansas City. Austin, why'd you go off for the Titans here? Yeah, so I picked against the Titans in this past week. Our uh, reason being, I didn't know uh, for sure at the time recording that A.J. Brown was going to be playing. However, he, he played and he stepped up in a huge way. That's the reason I'm leaning this way, because A.J. Brown can be a guy you can lean on. He's fantastic after the catch. He's a true difference maker in this Titans offense who have definitely been lacking explosive plays. That is what he is bringing back to this offense, and they're going to start to hit their stride with him. Um, hopefully they can continue to you know, uh, be opportunistic in the run game. Obviously, with Derrick Henry's lack of presence, it makes it a lot tougher. However, A.J. Brown's uh, his ability to get open and really create easier plays for Ryan Tannehill is the big difference. I'm glad you highlighted A.J. Brown, Austin, because if I'm – Miami this week that's all I'm doing in every single little element of film study is I'm highlighting AJ Brown and we know Brian Flores' defense is built off of cornerback play and his trust in his corners they need to have a big game in this one that's what I'm relying on here is that they can limit AJ Brown's production and from there their defense their front seven can take advantage of the lack of presence of Derrick Henry like you talked about I think the Dolphins they have a lot of things that they have to figure out schematically here on how to deal with AJ Brown how to limit him getting yards after the catch and how to limit him coming across the middle of the field. And that's a tougher uh, thing to do than it is to say, but I think that they'll find a way. I think Brian Flores, he's been great as of late coaching this team. We know that the Dolphins are going to be a late season team with him running the helm. And I think they look to move forward in this one and move to a better record after a win against the Tennessee Titans. Next matchup here, we got the Panthers at Saints. Panthers 5-10, and 10, Saints 7-7 seven and seven before that Monday night football matchup as well. And we both opted for the Saints here, despite them having some issues at that quarterback position. Of course, Taysom Hill not available for their Week 16 game, Austin. Not sure what his status will be for Week 17 as of now. Ian Book making the start for them on Monday Night Football. But the Panthers, I think the biggest thing here is they're just so inconsistent. I think Sam Darnold very likely will play in that game. And I also think that Cam Newton probably will play in this game. And even though the Saints have questions at quarterback, so do the Panthers. What's your thoughts on this matchup? Yeah, so like we've had issues all season long, picking these Panthers games are just impossible seemingly. Um, you know, they definitely should have, they should have a better record than they currently do, especially how they started off the season. A lot of inconsistent play on that offensive side of the football. And, and you look at Joe Brady, who is one of the hottest coordinator names in all of football after coming off of that fantastic season at LSU. It did not work out there for them. So they have to reestablish, create a new identity for themselves. And they got a lot to fix in this draft. Uh, they invested a lot in Sam Darnold. So it'll be interesting to see how they handle that situation. But in this game in particular, 
I think the Saints at home, you know, even though they, they get their own issues at quarterback, I just feel that they're the better roster as a whole. Both teams had, bat, you know, struggling starting quarterbacks. So at this point, you have to go the Saints considering that at home and just the better team. Right. Being at home here is a key advantage for New Orleans. And I think they get the job done against a struggling Carolina team that really doesn't have an identity right now, two and 10 in their last 12 games. Raiders at Colts, a great matchup here. Both teams fighting for their seasons at this point. And there's a lot on the line in this one. The Raiders at eight and seven, really hunting for a wild card spot, of course, behind the Kansas City Chiefs there in the AFC West. And then the Colts themselves, this is an opportunity. If Tennessee loses, the Colts could gain some ground there and even come into that 10 and six record if they get a win. We both opted for the Colts here. And the big thing for me is how do the Raiders look to slow down Jonathan Taylor? Of course, that's really the key thing every single week. They're going to be circling him. However, I think he's just too tough to cover. I think he's too tough to contain even today. 108 rush yards. I mean, he's just so productive when he touches the football. Austin, how do the Colts uh, look to move the football if Jonathan Taylor is contained? Yeah, I mean, obviously they're they're going to be looking outside. They got to look to their tight ends as well. Uh, Jonathan Taylor is always their main focal point. But, you know, the nice thing about that is even his presence allows the opportunity for some play action. And let's like Carson Wentz, absolutely just let it loose. And that's what he needs to do. That's how he needs to play. Um, obviously, you, you don't want him to have to keep throwing and throwing and throwing. That's the beautiful counterpart. Uh, and having Jonathan Taylor is you don't have to rely uh, strictly on Carson Wentz's arm. You can get him out moving. Uh, there, there's so much to love about this offense, especially how great their offensive line has been this season. Uh, a lot of credit to them and what they've been able to build. But for the Colts, they're going to control the line of scrimmage offensively. Um, and Derek Carr, you know, he's going to have a massive game. To, to really uh, pull off the upset. I know the records show that they're a one game difference. However, I feel the Colts are, are significantly better than the record shows. Yeah, I think the roster is much better if you're looking at Indianapolis, especially when you consider their offensive line. I think it's gonna mitigate some of the success we've seen from the Raiders defensive line this year. Uh, and I think the Colts do overcome in this one. Austin, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit here. You're talking about Carson Wentz and his uh, ability to function with Jonathan Taylor. We know that that pick from the Colts, the first round pick, is going to be going to the Philadelphia Eagles based off the percentage of snaps he's played for the team. Now, do you think uh, that the Colts won the trade acquiring Carson Wentz, or do you think the Eagles won that trade? Yeah, I mean, the Eagles, I think both teams actually do well in that trade, just considering that, that this is what the Colts needed. I mean, going into this season, it, it would have been a Sam Ellinger or uh, Jacob Eason at the quarterback spot. So I think it's actually... Uh, a win for it's tough to actually pick a true winner I think value wise the Eagles do great in that um, getting that first round pick it's going to be a later first round pick however getting it for you know just considering what you have I'm going to actually deem the Eagles as the winner right the Eagles probably a slim winner there but I think overall you probably consider this trade somewhat of a win-win just because both teams do come out pretty well based off of what they needed the Eagles were looking at moving on from Wentz the Colts really badly needed a quarterback. Both sides did come out pretty well in that one. Eagles at football team here, while we're on the topic of Philadelphia, Austin, they're eight and seven. The uh, football team, six and eight before their Sunday night matchup with the Dallas Cowboys. So we're looking at back-to-back -back big weeks here for Washington. They need to win the Dallas game. And then they would need an upset here against Philadelphia as well to really get the job done. We both picked the Eagles in this one though. And I think we've been talking about it all year long. Jalen Hurts, his dynamism, running the football. That's just tough to deal with. We know Washington has a great defensive line. Do you trust the secondary to hold up here against Philadelphia, though? Yeah, I, I just think Philadelphia, it, it's a tough matchup for Washington, despite them being at home. Jalen Hurts is just so dynamic with his legs. You know, Washington's dealt with some injuries along that defensive line. Chase Young, in particular, uh, is, is the big key in that. If Washington you know, was full strength there, I, I consider it a little more, but I just think the Eagles are hot and, and they played super, super well on this past Sunday. I, I like the Eagles in this one. You know, I know Miles Sanders has the injury. We're not sure of the the status on that, but they're just, they're too dynamic. And, and honestly, they've been the true underdogs this season. Nobody really expected them with Jalen Hurts to be eight and seven, eight and seven at this point in the year and really in the thick of the playoff hunt. And they very well could earn that final wildcard spot. Yeah, they're in a position where if they take care of business, went out, they very well could be representing that third NFC wildcard spot. Of course, the new playoff rule is definitely opening up a little bit more window of opportunity for some of these teams like the Philadelphia Eagles. And you love to see it for a guy like Jalen Hurts, who's had to overcome cer certain things. You know, a second round pick wasn't really necessarily looked at as the lead guy for a team. 
and he's emerged to be that for Philadelphia this season. Next game here, Broncos at Chargers. We got another interdivision matchup here, AFC West. Broncos, 7-8. and eight. The Chargers, 8-7 and seven with a really, really disappointing loss to the Houston Texans today, one that you would never expect coming into that matchup. However, we're both opting for the Chargers to bounce back here in this interdivision matchup against the Broncos. Drew Locke didn't look half bad today, didn't turn over the football through the air against the Las Vegas Raiders. However, the Broncos still did not win that game, only put up 13 points. Austin, the Chargers defense probably just a little too good here for Drew Locke, right? Yeah, I mean, coming off of an extremely disappointing loss to the Houston Texans, the Chargers need to bounce back in a big way. Justin Jackson made a ton of plays today for the Chargers. However, it was just not enough for them to overcome Houston, which is very surprising that we are saying that now. Uh, the, the, the Chargers, uh, their aerial attack is going to be tough but the nice thing is for Denver, they match up well. I, they are fantastic in pass coverage. They have some good corners. Uh, Sertan has had a great rookie season, but I, I just like the Chargers. You know, if it was at the Broncos, maybe I consider it, consider it. But for me, I think the, the Chargers aerial attack is just going to be a little bit too much. Patrick Sertan, of course, a great cornerback as a rookie. Very rare to see someone playing at his level that he's been playing at as a rookie cornerback in the NFL. But like you said, the Chargers, they have so many options, so many different guys they can get the ball to out in space. It's going to be a difficult matchup for the Denver Broncos. No shame in losing this game. However, the Chargers looking to keep their playoff hopes alive. They badly need this one. The Broncos hoping to play spoiler. Next matchup here we move in to is the Houston Texans at 4-11 versus the 8-7 San Francisco 49ers. And I don't see lightning striking in the bottle twice here. I don't see the Texans pulling off another big upset this week. 49ers, they also have playoff hopes, playoff aspirations, and they need this game badly as well. They're in competition with those Philadelphia Eagles for that third wildcard spot. They need this game. They need to move to 9-7, and seven, Austin. Is there any way the Texans pull this one out? Yeah, I just, I don't love it, especially with them on the road going to San Francisco. I think it's going to just be way too much for Davis Mills to handle. I think the, the pass rush of the 49ers is just going to overwhelm him for sure. Uh, you know, the Texans have been playing spoiler in quite a few of our pickums. I, I don't, I, I, pretty much every game that they play in, I, I, we pick against them for the most part. I know you picked them once uh, randomly this season. However, I just don't believe in this Texans roster. Uh, Davis Mills being the rookie quarterback, being inexperienced. Um, you know, credit to him against the Chargers. However, I don't I don't see it going the same way against the San Francisco team. Yeah, the San Francisco defense is extremely tough. And like I said, they badly need this game. Jimmy Grapple has played fairly well this season as well, Austin. Let's talk about him a little bit. Of course, they did draft Trey Lance in the top five last year. Of course, moved up for him as well. So there's a lot of hopes and aspirations for that franchise that they're going to move to Trey Lance at some point in the near future. Do you see Jimmy Grapple on a different team next season? I think it's very possible. I think it's going to be, you know, via trade. I mean, you have to look at Jimmy Garoppolo as being that guy that can be a bridge quarterback for some teams. Uh, there, there's a couple of quarterback needy teams like Denver now, all of a sudden that's opened up and and uh, teams that miss out on potential Deshaun Watson trade could be looking there. So he presents a great bit bridge quarterback situation. Atlanta very well could be looking at him depending on how things shake out in the draft. So he very well could be on the move because the future future is Trey Lance in that organization. Very interesting name to watch for is Jimmy G there in San Francisco, but I think his biggest focus is getting a win against the Houston Texans this next week. Rams at Ravens here. Ravens, eight and seven. They dropped their last two games, of course, and it's be a uh, large part because they have not had Lamar Jackson. He's been not available for them. Tyler Huntley, he's been playing some pretty solid football, but it's just hard to replace someone who's a former league MVP, whereas the Rams here, 11 and four, They've been rolling, beat the Minnesota Vikings today. Odell Beckham Jr. has looked like to be a good acquisition for them. They've been winning a couple games as of late, of course, had a little bit of a rough stretch when they first brought him in. But I think now that they've kind of found some chemistry, him and Matt Stafford, they've kind of got things rolling. We're both going with the Rams here, Austin. Over under here, 50 yards for Odell Beckham Jr. I think he's going to hit the, the over in this game. The Ravens secondary is banged up. They've been struggling. They just gave up a ton of yards to Joe Burrow uh, and the, the that receiving core, which was crazy. All of them, all of the main guys for Cincinnati went over that 50 yard mark. So it's hard for me to, to say the under on that one. The Ravens, they've been banged up this year, of course, losing their two starting cornerbacks and Marcus Peters, Marlon Humphrey. And then you also lose Lamar Jackson for a little bit of time. It's just tough to overcome that. Your number one wide receiver coming in, Rashad Bateman missed a lot of time at the start of the year. It's a testament to how good their roster is built that they're even eight and seven at this point with some of the injuries they've sustained and some of the COVID issues that they've had. 
Uh, you know, you look at the running backs too, J.K. Dobbins, Gus, Gus Edwards. Most teams couldn't sustain what they have sustained up to this point. It's awesome to see them at eight and seven, but I think they move to eight and eight after the Rams take care of business here on the road. Moving to our next matchup, Lions at Seahawks. Lions 2, 12 and one. Seahawks 5 and 10. We both opt for Seattle here. I think a key thing here is you are playing in Seattle. You have those fans there backing Russell Wilson and that football team. But I think if there's one word to describe the Detroit Lions this year, I think it would have to be competitive or another one maybe gritty because they have been super competitive in games. I think that they were, you know, one of the least talented teams coming in this year. But Dan Campbell, say what you want about him. He, you know, gives some funny interviews. Uh, a little up and down when it comes to X's and O's, maybe some decision making is a little bit questionable, but he gets his guys ready to play and they're going to come in ready to play in this one as well. This is going to be a tight, close game. The Seahawks, of course, are hoping to win every single game here because they don't even have their first round pick. It goes to the New York Jets. So they want to win even despite their five and 10 record at this point. Austin, what do the Lions have to do to get it done? Yeah, I mean, they need to just bottle up Seattle and make them one dimensional, make them constantly throwing. That's where the, the Lions want them to be. Seattle struggled running the ball this year. And defensively, they've just, they've not looked the part from the, the, you know, the previous Seattle teams, just so dominant defensively. And now, you know, the last couple of years has not been the same story. Despite, you know, you, you still have the same head coach, you have the same general manager. It, it's just been a different vibe there in Seattle. However, I think the Seattle Seahawks need to really bounce back, especially since they're not concerned about a draft pick. They're going to give it their all as every team you know does every single week. But the Seattle Seahawks have to come out and win this one. Otherwise, there's going to be huge questions in Seattle. Right. This defense is very atypical for a Pete Carroll led team, usually near the top end of the league this year. They've had a ton of struggles. Of course, you look at that secondary probably as one of those areas of improvement for the Seattle Seahawks this offseason. We'll see what they do to build up their team. But in this one, we do have the Seahawks pulling off the win against the Detroit Lions. Next matchup here, Cardinals at Cowboys. And I think it's a good one. Cowboys 10 and four before Sunday Night Football. Cardinals 10 and five. You have the Cardinals going. You talked about that a little bit in the open. For me, I'm going with the Cowboys, and I think it's going to be a lot about how they move the football offensively for the Dallas Cowboys. They've got so many good weapons. I know Amari Cooper has been a little up and down with some of his performance as of late, but I think if you're looking at the Dallas Cowboys, how they're going to beat the Arizona Cardinals is going to be all about their offense. They need to establish the run game early. Pollard's been great for them this year. I think they're going to have to look for him to have a good game. And then you also have to look at Dak Prescott making things happen with his arm. He's been great all season long as well. He's really, really been fantastic after coming back from a serious injury like he did have. I think that we see the Dallas Cowboys roll. Austin, again, touch on the Cardinals. Why do you have them winning? Yeah, so once again, I do have the Cowboys winning in my pick them here. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of the same things you touched on. It, it's Dak Prescott, their dynamism on offense. Um, the Cardinals have had a weird bumpy stretch here uh, at the end of the season. However, you know, I think it's going to be a really, really competitive game. I give the Cowboys the edge. It's going to be a loud environment there in Dallas. Um, you know, I give the edge to the home team. And they are still the underdog in this one. That's why they were my upside pick. But, you know, Dak Prescott's going to have to have a huge game. I think Kyler Murray's going to have a massive game as well. It's, this one should be a shootout. This will definitely be a good game. Arguably the game of the week this week. Then looking at the NFC North matchup for Sunday Night Football. I'm glad this is the Sunday night game. You get to see the 7-8 and eight Vikings go into Lambeau Field and face the 12-3 and three Packers. And like I said in the open, this is a must-win game for the Minnesota Vikings. They have to pull this one out. Austin, you're going with the Packers here. I think the Packers are the better team. But the Vikings, in years past, they've had the Packers number in key games. I specifically think about the one where Case Keenum went in there, Austin, and pulled the job out against Green Bay. And I think they need a performance like that from Kirk Cousins this week. I think that he has to go in there. He has to be the man in the arena. He's got to outduel Aaron Rodgers. And I think it's very possible. Him and Justin Jefferson have been so electric through their first two years together. And Jefferson, I, I'm looking at him. He needs a big game. And hopefully Adam Thielen, if he's able to go uh, and able to play at a high level, they need that as well. They need every little bit they can get from that wide receiver core. That's the strength of their team. Kirk Cousins has to be that guy. Why do the Packers ultimately get it done for you, Austin? Yeah, because I think, you know, just because they are playing at Lambeau, uh, historically speaking, the Packers have been great against the Vikings when they are at home, when they're at Lambeau. Aaron Rodgers has been great at home as well. Uh, another part of it, Jair Alexander being out in that first matchup was a, a big key for me. Um, you know, if he's back in this game, if he's playing in this game, uh, you definitely have to consider them to be the favorites just because of how talented he is. 
and he's really going to have to shadow Justin Jefferson. That's the key for me. If they can shut down Justin Jefferson and you have a, a an unhealthy Adam Thielen, it really leaves KJ Osborne being the guy moving forward in that offense and being the focal point in the passing game. So that makes a very, very tough and uphill climb for that Vikings team. Right, KJ Osborne, he's had a good year as a number three option, but like you're saying, Austin, you know, there's a big drop off between a guy like Justin Jefferson, who's an all world wide receiver to KJ Osborne, who's a solid number three guy. There's just a massive drop off. There's no you know, discredit to KJ Osborne and what Austin's saying there. He's completely right though. When you try and eliminate a top guy, you have to uh, try and allow other people to beat you. And if you're the Packers, you're gonna bet on KJ Osborne trying to beat you rather than Justin Jefferson. Browns at Steelers here, Monday Night Football. Browns seven and eight, the Steelers seven, seven and one. And this is a competition to not finish last in that AFC North. Currently that division, very, very tight. All, all four of those teams in that division could end up 500 or better, which is you know crazy to see, especially when you have such good talented teams there that they don't you know knock each other off a little bit. Austin, we both opted for the Steelers here. And I think the biggest thing is this game's at Heinz Field, Monday Night Football. The Browns have been dealing with a lot of health questions all year long. How do the Browns go about getting this one done and trying to upset the Steelers here? Uh, really, it's a, it, all season long, it's been about getting after Big Ben because he just can't move in the pocket. Uh, he's a slower decision maker than he's been in the past. Um, he does not evade the, the rush as well. I mean, he used to be a really, really hard guy to bring down just because of his big body and his overall strength. Uh, that has dwindled over the last couple of seasons. So it's about getting after Big Ben, forcing pressure up the middle, making him try to move his legs and, and extend plays outside, which just don't happen any, anymore. So that would be the key to the victory for the Browns. However, I, I just think the Pittsburgh Steelers, with them being at home, that's the key here. They play very well at Heinz Field, uh, historically speaking. Um, you know, it's really going to be about getting Deontay Johnson all day long. I mean, he's such a good inconsistent target for Big Ben. They're also going to have to run, run the ball effectively against this Browns front. Austin, I have a question for you here about Ben Roethlisberger because a lot of our younger viewers maybe don't really know who Ben Roethlisberger used to be as a player. Of course, someone who used to be very mobile could extend plays with his legs. And that was actually one of his strongest uh, play styles. That's one. That's something that made him a really good quarterback, you know, over a decade ago. Do you think his current lack of mobility is a byproduct of just his age specifically or perhaps some of his offseason decision making that you know he doesn't train as hard as some of these other guys what what more do you uh find in that yeah so i mean it, it's really tough to truly decipher what's the what's the key issue here but you know i th think part of it is you know as he's aged uh, he's not able to just rely on his pure raw athleticism like he used to i mean he's just a, a way worse athlete than when he first came into the league and you had mentioned you know that that was his style of play he was able to bounce off the defenders he was a guy that could really truly extend plays and I just think mentally he's slowed down as well. Despite him playing longer in the league, I just he doesn't make those quick decisions that he used to. Um, but a lot of it is predicated of, on his lack of athleticism and the Steelers structurally just not being where they used to be with their offensive line. So that those are the big issues for them. However, I mean, they're a talented roster uh, and they always win under Mike Tomlin. So hopefully they can get back over 500 and I think they get the job done. Yeah, I think they do as well here. Move to eight, seven and one. And that'll conclude our video today. Hopefully you guys did really enjoy. Thank you so much for watching here at Utility Sports. We really do appreciate all of the support, all the love that you guys show on our videos. Again, hopefully you guys really did enjoy. If you did, smash that like button, subscribe if you're new, turn on that notification bell, and we'll catch you in the very next Utility Sports video.